So where do the dinosaurs fit in? Well, the word dinosaur, if we went to Wikipedia and looked up uh, this, they would tell us that dinosaurs first appeared in the Triassic period uh, two, three, one point four million years ago and were the dominant terrestrial vertebrates for 135 million years from the beginning of the Jurassic about 201 million years ago until the end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago when they became extinct. And the subtlety of that, you know, it looks so posh. Two, two, three, one point four million, so, such precision. Um, quite interesting, uh, when I put the slide together for last year, it said 201 billion. Uh, and I thought, well, I'd better just check that they haven't changed this. And actually, if we go in today to Wikipedia, the 201 has been changed to 200. <laughs> but we still have the 231.4 million. So, um, as I say, this is the wonderful marketing tool of the evolutionists, the um, dinosaurs. So, you know, to try and get a handle around what length of time they are claiming that the dinosaurs existed uh, isn't very easy. Uh, if you imagine the width of that screen, which I didn't measure it, but for, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure it's a six foot screen. So uh, that screen is six feet, two meters. And if we say, well, let's use that length, that width of that screen to represent 6,000 years, then how far have I got to move that arrow down there to represent a period of uh, two, three, one, four, oh, 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 years? Um, so what, what would it be? Um, and I'll give you some choices. Hands up those would say A. B? So you're all going to jump for C, aren't you? Well, you're going to be right, yes. So it is an immense distance. I would have to extend that arrow 77 kilometres, 48 miles, um, to represent that time period. So, you know, reading the Bible, we're used to 6,000 years. The evolutionist time scale is so immense that it is actually mind boggling. And if we just put a map up of Nottingham, you know, that, that screen would have to extend almost to Boston or above Doncaster or nearly to Socon Trent or down to Rugby. It just gives us a bit of a flavour of the, these, these figures that they trot out uh, and we believe there is no firm foundation for those datings at all. Just put those in. So, there is a problem with all these millions of years ago because we find dinosaur remains which aren't all fossilised. They found dinosaurs which are called fresh. And, you know, how can you fit that in if they died out millions of years ago? How could they preserve themselves over a long period of time? And they've even gone so far as to find blood, the remains of blood inside dinosaur bones, which indicates to any rational person that that creature died not very long ago. It could not have been dead millions of years ago. Blood does not exist for that period of time. And we also have man-made depictions of dinosaur-like creatures alongside with man. And one either has to say, and you know, this is one of the fields we're going to look at, uh, were they just imagining it and depicted these dinosaur-like creatures purely out of their imagination, and lo and behold, then we come along and we find, yes, there were creatures like that. Or does it make much more sense that these creatures existed at the time when they were doing the carvings and they were giving us uh, a picture of what they knew about? Uh, and also, the other problem is that many things haven't changed. Now, evolution is supposed to, when you think of going from pond scum to man over a four million years, billion years, um, there are lots of changes, and yet we find today still plants and animals that existed in the time of the dinosaurs still with us and unchanged. So that again is, is quite a problem for the uh, evolutionary uh, viewpoint. So we're going to look at dinosaurs, we're going to see how there are worldwide depictions of dinosaurs 
and look at some of the living fossils, creatures which were thought to be extinct, but we now find that they are still alive in spite of being allegedly millions of years old. Look at perhaps some living dinosaurs and the fact that there's fresh blood. Uh, and then ask the question, well, why don't we read? If we went to a biblical dictionary, why don't we find the words dinosaurs? And we'll explain uh, why that word doesn't exist there. But I believe that descriptions of dinosaurs are there. And we'll see how a part of God's creation, contemporary with man, and the changes that came at the time of the flood are a very rational explanation as to why the dinosaurs died out. And we shall finally end up at Jurassic Park, which might not, to those that don't go very often to cinemas and that, might not mean a lot, but uh, we'll just end up on that. So dinosaurs can be found all over the world. Uh, there are remains of dinosaurs, and dinosaurs range in size from little tiny chicken-sized things to huge, huge, huge things. So they were creatures which are found, the remains have been found, all over the world. Now, the, there's a depiction of a man there, just to give you some idea of scale. Um, the Brachiosaurus, about 13 metres high, the Supersaurus, about 17 and the sauropodian, uh, about 18 metres high. Now, has anybody any idea what the height of this hall is? You've been coming and worshipping here for a long time, surely you know how high your hall is? <laughs> 25 feet. 25 feet, right. So converting that swiftly to metres is about uh, eight, eight, eight metres. So if you imagine we got to the... Twice that height, at least, for the uh, top one there. So it gives you some idea of uh, the huge scale of these things. And it's just recently um, been... Uh, oh, I didn't realise I'm trying to This uh, Tyrannosaurus uh, was a discovery just a few years ago, and that now tops 20 metres. So you're you know, thinking of three times almost the height of this hall here. Uh, and the bones were immense. Uh, there's a picture of the bones being uncovered, and uh, there's uh, a chap lying on one of the bones. That is a bone, you know, the length of a man. Huge, huge size. And it's estimated that it will be about 40 metres. Now, again, I've no idea what the length of this hall is. I should have paced this out, but uh, I, I forgot to. How much? Oh, these people are still working for me. Um, right, well, 130, so uh, it would be twice the length of this hall from uh, tip to toe. So, pretty big, pretty big. Now, we understand that about 95% is very difficult to actually, when you have fossilised creatures, to actually work out what they eat, but um, <laughs> evolutionists are fairly confident that the vast majority were plant eaters. And we shall see the significance of that. And as I say, that some are only chicken size and others are huge size. And uh, alongside those, we have flying reptiles um, us with huge wingspans. Um, so again, a wingspan um, 50 feet, so nearly the, the length of this. So imagine something flying overhead with a wingspan. It'd be like a little plane, isn't it, coming overhead. Now, one of the problems with dinosaurs, as with all the fossils, is that they cannot find missing links which show an indication of a change from one creature to another. There are many things that are brought forward, but if you just wait a year or two, the evidence is found not to be true. And so there are no uh, intermediate links between uh, whatever they think came before the dinosaurs to the dinosaurs. And the other thing that one has to remember, that all the pictures you see of the dinosaurs are completely artistic. What they have found is a pile of bones. And from a pile of bones, they have reconstructed what they think it looked like and then got an artist in to um, draw it. So, yes, maybe you can put the bones together and get a kind of skeleton like that, but it really doesn't give you any indication of what the creature actually looked like. And we can illustrate that 
uh, that creature there, it could be drawn to look like a little lion, a young lion. Uh, in fact, it is a poodle. And, you know, lions and poodles don't really look alike, but their skeletons are very similar. And, uh, you know, that could perhaps be a turkey. Um, it is actually a peacock. So, you know, you, you cannot, from just reconstructing a skeleton, say what that creature is going to look like. So, any pictures that you see that I've put up on the screen, <laughs> Uh, and any pictures you see in any books at school of that, of the dinosaurs and any ancient creatures, are merely the speculation of an artist. Now, um, one we're in, it's not the field going to look at, but when one's looking at the alleged ancestors of man, then there is very much a bias if the artist is thinking, well, this is part of an evolutionary chain, and we've got to get up to man from an ape, then they will draw it very much with that bias in mind. So, you know, something to think about. These pictures are not realities. They're just what an artist has thought. I say very often that it's just an absolute mass of bones, fossilised bones are found, and you, you don't know what it looks like at all. Now, there are many historical accounts... Uh, of there being very large creatures, not only in this country, but around the world. And there are also these ancient depictions of creatures which today we say, well, they don't exist. But as I said earlier, we have to speculate, well, perhaps they did exist in earlier times. One great example is in Babylon. The Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, was well known for his uh, ornamentation of the cities that he built and you can go to the room where most of them now are in museums but you can see the depictions of creatures which are perfectly normal you look at it say well that's a horse you know that's a bird and that but there are some creatures which are a bit odd if you look at the front legs and look at the back legs have you ever seen a creature that has paws at the front and claws at the back um, and rather a strange long neck. Now one has to say, well, alongside all these creatures that we recognise, did he have a lot of cheese one night and just dream of some creature and then go and make it in tiles? Or was this a creature that was extant in his day? And there is a depiction. It no longer exists, but um, this could well be so. There are so many um, stories around the world of fire-breathing dragons, and we'll see the significance of that uh, in a moment. George slaying the dragon. Now, not very far from where I live, but Breeden on Hill in uh, Leicestershire. Again, very similar like the uh, carvings or the, the tiles in Babylon. These are carvings around the church. And again, you can see all sorts of rational creatures that you know about. But then there is a panel um, like this, and uh, one can see that um, they're what we will call bipedal creatures, uh, long legs and very short uh, little arms to them. And again, one has to say, well, did he just pluck this up out of the air, or did such creatures exist uh, in his day when these go back to the 8th, 9th century AD? Oh, yes, I've forgotten, I've got it a bit more in the eye. So, yes, yeah, so you, can, you can see the, the, the quite small forearms on these creatures. Well, bear in mind, um, this is... Uh, we're losing the top of the picture, aren't we? No, no. Um, this is in the Carlisle Cathedral, uh, and this is the tomb, the top of a tomb, uh, of one of the bishops of Carlisle. It's normally covered over with a carpet to preserve it, um, because it is set in the floor, but you can get permission to roll the carpet back. And uh, it's beautifully inlaid with brass. It's got a bit uh, worn down. But a uh, depiction of the bishop uh, in the middle there, you can see it more artistically done there, what it probably was like in the original. And uh, around the... Sorry, press the wrong button. Uh, around the outside are various words and also little depictions. 
and uh, depictions of creatures which we would think of being very much uh, dinosaur-like, the sagasaurs and all the rest of them, strange creatures that we, we couldn't identify. You see its teeth there and its long tail there. And, um, these two seem to be uh, with their necks entwined there. But uh, creatures which, again, we would say, well, they don't exist. Uh, millions of years ago they did exist, the evolutionists would say. But again, one has to say, well, is it more reasonable? Because there are birds and other fishes and all sorts of uh, depictions of creatures around there. Uh, isn't it more reasonable to suggest that they are um, creatures which were, they were acquainted with, did exist, uh, and they have reproduced them? This is a temple carving in Cambodia which looks very much like a Sagasaurus with these um, plates on its back. Now the critic says, oh well no, that, that those um, are actually just background and which admittedly, well you've got funny things around there and maybe it is, you know, one cannot prove these things but it is just very interesting that that very much look, does look like a Stegosaurus with its um, spiny uh, plates on the back of it. This is in uh, Utah on the White Canyon. You can just about make out the outline of a man there. And here, and one's had to draw over it because it is so faint, but a creature that looks very much like a sauropod dinosaur. Uh, and clearly, you know, they, they seem to be contemporary. Whoever drew this, you know, drew a man and then drew one of these dinosaurs. So it you know, just opens up a, a, a different field, which we're going to get to when we see how it does fit in with the Bible. This is uh, not quite strictly on the dinosaur level, but living fossils give us this indication that just because a thing is found in fossils doesn't mean to say that it's not going to be alive today. And one of the classic uh, examples is the Coleocanth, which was thought to have died out 65 million years ago. Uh, and yet, in the 1938, this uh, biologist was in South Africa and was wandering around the market and was looking at the fish that were on display and saw what she only knew as a fossil and drawings from the fossil as a coleocanth. And they now found that it's very much alive. And of course the evolutionists, when they found the fossils of that, said that here we have, you know, primitive legs emerging. And this was uh, one of the creatures in the chain from going to the fish to the land animals. Well, now they observe living coleocants. Uh, they are very much bottom feeders. And yes, they, they use them to scoot along the bottom, but they're not legs and uh, an emerging creature changing from a fish to uh, a land animal. And the Komodo dragons, it was only just over 100 years ago that, sorry, I'm jumping over this cable here. Um, and these creatures are, are very much uh, prehistoric looking, uh, rather frightening creatures and quite vicious creatures, so uh, don't go up and pet them, they'll have you in no time. Um, but again, there are creatures which, unless we knew that they were alive and had been found, we would say, well, this is a prehistoric uh, creature. And uh, it's going back to 1908, uh, 2008, uh, they found the fossil of this creature, which they estimated lived 20,000 years ago, and in our second part we shall see why we can adjust some of these long dates. Um, but like I said, it's very much like a, a larger version of a souped-up Komodo uh, dragon, uh, which was supposed to be an extinct millions of years ago. This, they think, was only 20,000 years ago. And the Occupy, uh, that was once um, my time when I was at school, you know, the evolutionary uh, chain, uh, depiction of the horse, how the horse evolved, uh, this creature was part of that chain. It's now found, it's still alive, it's not a, an ancient creature at all, um, and has no connection with the horses.
I also said that in the fossils we find remains of uh, plants. I've got a ginkgo biloba tree growing in my garden. It's not a prehistoric plant, but the remains, it's a very distinctive leaf. That's how um, one can uh, see it. And embedded in the fossils at the time when dinosaurs did work on the earth, were ginkgo biloba trees, which are still here today. And there are interesting, tantalising accounts of dinosaur-like creatures alive today in uh, places like um, the Congo and that. And there have been expeditions to go and find these creatures. They have never succeeded, a bit like the Loch Ness, Loch Ness Monster. But this uh, Mahmoud of Membi, the blocker of the river, when a white man came along and showed the natives who were living in the Congo pictures of some of the dinosaur-type creatures, um, they identified this particular one as being there, and their others had seen it, and they were in fear of it. So it could well be, uh, although the earth has been explored, there's an awful lot of places that man hasn't really got to. So there may well still be uh, living dinosaurs. Um, this uh, gentleman, Blasford Snell, about 15 years ago, uh, was in Nepal, and he found what are described as prehistoric uh, elephants. They've never been seen by a white man until 15 years ago. Um, and these Nepalese uh, elephants have a very distinctive hump. Um, I have a vested interest in Blasford Snell. I tell this story every time, but um, we have a telephone by the side of our bed, it's on, it's on Anthea's side, and about three o'clock in the morning the phone went, and this crackly voice said, this is Blashford Snell here, can I speak to so-and-so, and it obviously got the wrong number. And Anthea's quick as flash, because she'd been fast asleep, said, this is the Queen of Sheba here, and put the phone down. <laughs> Um, but when we go and look at uh, old cave paintings in France, allegedly 30,000 years ago, you can see that distinctive hump. So that's not a prehistoric creature that's still alive in Nepal. If we just go back to uh, that one there, you can just see how it matches the uh, Nepalese type of elephant. And this is interesting, I mean, it goes back to 1961, but uh, they discovered this big bone bed and the bones were fresh, so they didn't think much of it. They just thought that it was bison country. They thought these bones were remains of bison. And it wasn't until 20 years later that they began to re-examine these bones uh, and they found that they were remains of uh, a duck-billed dinosaur. So here were bones which were what we would call fresh rather than mineralised, fossilised. And yet it was supposed to have died out 70 million years ago. So how could it remain fresh over that time? Um, it, it points to the fact there is something wrong with this dating mechanism which is beloved of geologists which uh, from the fossil record has all these various um, periods uh, going back to six, 650 billion million years ago. And these characteristic fossils that are found, uh, which they use to date the um, rocks, if they find a certain fossil in it, then they will call it a Cambrian one. If they find that fossil, it's uh, another one there. But the interesting thing is that they're all associated with sediments. You only get fossils in sedimentary layers. And as we shall be looking in the next half, uh, I, I think this much more depicts the order of their death. Smaller creatures, the sea creatures first, and then the bigger ones who could escape the waters being much later before they were buried. And this doesn't represent millions of years, but represents the flood year. You see, the remains that we find uh, are, are so interesting. Now, I've slotted this one in, so hang on to that because that's the next slide too. So this is going back to this um, finding the blood. 
Um, so it was in 2006, 10 years ago, that uh, this Mary was uh, absolutely astounded as she was examining the, um, the dinosaur bones that there were these blood vessels and uh, blood structures which were just you know, as if it had died so quite recently. So that, that was quite a shock. Um, and nobody ever thought that you could ever find blood because of this preconception. They must be millions of years old. This throws great doubt on that. And uh, this was a more recent one, just uh, last December. Um, uh, some more fossils were found to have uh, all these uh, blood vessels. Um, how they could exist over a long period of time, they do not know. But because they are so set that dinosaurs existed long ago, they are prepared to accept the almost impossible to believe that blood and soft tissues could exist for millions of years. Doesn't make sense at all. Right, so why don't we see dinosaurs in the Bible? Well, a very simple reason is that the word dinosaur only came into existence in 1842. I shouldn't have pushed that in, should I? We can't see it on the screen there, but I was wanting to play the did. Oh dear. How do I stop this? It's a fascinating, I'm just going to eject it and hope I can clear that. Fascinating um, DVD, it's on, down the back there, Tracking the Flood, about um, exploring in America and just seeing how the flood makes much more sense of the rock strata, but that's a bit by the way. So, back to dinosaurs. Uh, 1842 was when uh, that gentleman, Richard Owen, having come across these strange um, remains of, of large creatures, um, being a Greek scholar, he strung together two Greek words, terrible lizards, and that's the, where dino, the word dinosaur comes from, terrible lizards. And so anything written after 1842, yes, we will find the word dinosaur. Anything written before 1842, we will not find the word dinosaur. But what interests us is, do we find descriptions in the Bible of dinosaur-like creatures? Well, we, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we're told that God created great sea creatures. The authorised version has whales. But uh, this covers a, a very wide range of things. But it tells us that in the seas there were huge creatures which uh, God had made. Um, and the, there are two words that are used. Um, one is great, big, uh, and the other is this tannin, which is a marine or land monster. And it's translated in the authorised version by dragons, sea monsters, serpents, whales, jackals, and that kind of thing. And uh, I believe that when we come to Job, now Job is the oldest book that we have in the Old Testament. A person lived uh, not so very long, just a few hundred years after the flood. God introduces to Job the wonders of his creation. This is just the New King James that just... Just gives it a little um, crispness. And God appeals to Job to look at this creature and see how immense, how powerful, how superior this creature is, which God has made. So what is Job doing questioning this great creator who has made all things? And when we read this, I believe that we are reading a description which we can more closely match with one of the dinosaurs than any other creature. So let's just read through what Job, if you've got your Bibles, um, just uh, look and you can see the differences between the New King James and the uh, King James or whatever version you've got. So Job chapter 40 and verse 15. Look now at the behemoth which I made 
along with you, so contemporary with man. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs are like bars of iron. He is first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Now, dear. Surely the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus trees in the covert of the reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he is not disturbed. He is confident. Though the Jordan gushes into his mouth, though he takes it in his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare. So, a description of a, a creature which is, um, God says, you know, this is a wonderful creature that I have made. And the word behemoth uh, is a, a plural of intensity. The beast of beasts, God says, of this creature. Uh, the biggest land creature that God has made. Now, we just pull together the description. So it's described as the beast of beasts. It is clearly contemporary with man. I made him with you. Uh, and it would have no relevance if it was a creature that had been died out millions of years before Job. You know, it would have absolutely no meaning at all, would it? It has great strength. Its tail is compared to a cedar. Now, the cedar is very distinctive because you can tell a cedar very easily because its branches go straight out like that. So it has a tail like a cedar. Uh, it's chief of the ways of God, and he is absolutely fearless. Now, if you look in your margins in the authorised version, you'll say it might have uh, a hippopotamus or an elephant. So we just put, he moves his tail like a cedar. Does that look like a cedar? Does that look like a cedar? No. But if we look at some of these huge creatures, um, now that is from one of the ancient books. Just while I remember, in the lobby, two thirds of the table are some of my books that I've got on evolution creation. There are some books for sale on the end and then you've got the DVDs over there. That's from a book that I bought many years ago. And the depiction of these creatures was with the tails dragging on the ground. Um, it's quite a few years ago now, probably 10, 12 years ago. Uh, they realised that these tails weren't an encumbrance dragging on the ground, but they were a wonderful counterweight uh, to their long heads. And if you go into museums now, they have hoisted up these tails so that they are more or less vertical which is very interesting. Here is a, a newer depiction of uh, a Brachiosaurus. And yes, you imagine that. You know, you've been behind a big Labrador with its tail banging like that. How about a, uh, it can really hurt your knees. Well, think of a big creature like that with a, a tail probably 20 feet long, um, you know, just sweeping around. It would be very distinctive, you know, a tail like a cedar. We don't know of any creatures alive today that have got tails like cedars. But these um, ancient creatures, which were thought to exist a long time ago, what we're proposing is that they were contemporary with man. As time went on after the flood, they began to die out. But in the time of Job, close to the flood, there were plenty of examples of these creatures which they were afraid of. Uh, absolutely fearless. Well, moving on, in the next chapter, if we just turn over into the next chapter, in Job chapter 41, God now directs Job's attention to a sea creature. And again, just note the descriptions and try and think of a creature that matches that. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? 
Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle, never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall not one be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. I missed a few verses out, so verse 12. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, or his graceful proportions. 14. Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together and cannot be parted. His sneezings flash forth light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Strength dwells in his neck. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear, dart, or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. His undersides are like sharp potsherds. He spreads pointed marks in the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. On earth there is none like him, which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. So again, let's just put up some of the characteristics. He was contemporary with man, and therefore the appeal of God to look at this creature and consider the greatness of God who can create such creatures. He can't be harpooned. He's got these terrible teeth. He's got strong scales. He leaves pointed marks as his footprints. Smoke and fire comes out of his nostrils. He's king of all the animals absolutely fearless well again if you've got a marginal reference it'll probably will say crocodile um, it does leave pointed marks it does have close scales i've never seen fire come out of the mouth of a crocodile i don't know whether you have um, they have found remains of huger crocodiles this one uh, 12 meters long so Goodness, uh, what do we say this hall was? 70 feet, was it? Which was 20, 22 metres, so about half the length of uh, this hall. Um, we don't know, but this description of fire coming out of its mouth, you see, we have depictions of dragons, whether we go to China, whether we go to India, around the world. Was it all by chance, or were there creatures? that were capable of creating fire. Well, this, uh, I wish I wouldn't give him such long names, Parasolophus, he has a very strange horn, and it is thought that he was capable, or she, that's enough, capable of firing fire, because the horn is pointing backwards. And normally you have horns in order to fight. I don't think a horn pointing backwards is going to help you very much. Um, but it has, if we just enlarge it up, um, it's got these two passageways which interlink. And it is thought that probably there were sacks of the right chemicals which could be mixed and then fired through as uh, fire out of its nose. Now, that isn't too... Um, Unusual because the bombardier beetles, totally different scale, it's only about uh, 2.5 centimetres an inch long. But that little tiny creature is capable of mixing two chemicals together with um, catalysts and firing at 100 degrees C at its enemies. Um, so it has hydrogen peroxide, it has hydroquinone. And they meet together in this, what they call, explosion sack, um, where the catalyse and that are mixed, and then it comes out at uh, 100 degrees centigrade and can fire up to 20 shots, boom, 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 boom. And it has a wonderful mechanism. It can tuck its tail underneath it, direct it left, right, down, 
up with these little paddles uh, at the back. There. An absolutely incredible creature which is capable of fire. And we have all sorts of electric creatures, don't we? Fireflies and glowworms and all, all sorts of wonderful creatures which create light. So when the Bible tells us, here's a creature that's um, exuded fire, we have to accept God as his word. All, all the rest of the description we take literally. Why don't we take that? And, as I say, we do know of this strange creature which has got this backward horn with the right kind of passages, very much on a, a bigger scale of the bombardier beetle, that, yeah, could well be. And how terrifying that would be to have a creature which did actually um, blow out fire. Well, why don't we see dinosaurs when we go out the door? Why do they die well, the evolutionists have all sorts of ideas that a meteor hits the earth. Uh, well, if it hit the earth, it surely will wipe everything out. Why just the dinosaurs? Uh, another, that there was uh, a rise in the temperature, or perhaps a drop in the temperature, both are speculated, and this caused the dinosaurs to die out. Well, why didn't it affect uh, all the creatures? They even speculate that they had constipation and so died out because they were constipated. Um, they also uh, speculate that they grew very fat and uh, obese and died out because of that. And, uh, the latest thing is that there were parasites which ate away at their jawbones because they found some jawbones with strange uh, grooves in them. But all sorts of ideas that they try to speculate why these creatures suddenly uh, dried out, died out. Well, let's, let's try and fit it within this biblical framework to say that uh, you know, they did exist in the time of Job, these creatures, and in the time when the carver was carving round Breeding Church and places like that. Very recently they found dinosaurs uh, in the Arctic. And uh, they now had to realise all their ideas because they thought that dinosaurs couldn't exist in cold conditions. Um, and that's why, you know, they thought they had died off and yet they found that dinosaurs were quite happy in... Uh, colder conditions and Arctic conditions, when temperature would have been about 10 degrees centigrade. And uh, it, it came to the conclusion that dinosaurs were incredibly diverse in polar regions, as diverse in the tropical regions. It was a big surprise for us. Everything's a big surprise for evolutionists because they have to change their ideas, don't they, all the time, the more things they find. But as I say, Let's fit them in contemporary with man, and there are tracks existing not only in America, but um, in just north of Turkey uh, and in Russia, of clear dinosaur footprints and uh, human footprints side by side. You can see the toe marks of the human and the toe marks of the uh, dinosaur, which would seem to indicate that they were contemporary together. Uh, there are ancient accounts, the uh, Beowulf, um, born in 495 AD, it's in Denmark, and there are ancient writings which recall how he slew the Grendel, and the, um, it's in an old English epic poem which people just thought was just made up. But now it is thought, well no, this is an actual description of bipedal creatures um, with two small front limbs, which Beowulf uh, slew. And it was known as the Grendel. But it had these very strong jaws. And it had very tough skin. It was, you know, they were really frightened of it, the, the Danes, because they couldn't kill them. And uh, it was a very ugly creature and hunted at night. But uh, how Beowulf slew it was by tearing off its forelimb. Now, it's not very uh, pleasant to talk about, but it's very interesting. In the Babylonian um, seals, which they used, you know, to roll to create an impression on clay, there is a depiction of this man with this weapon, 
But that's what he seems to be doing to attack this dragon-like creature, is to tear off its um, limb, which is exactly what this epic poem said. You know, that's uh, 500 BC, this is 500 AD. Um, was used by Beowulf to slay this creature, was an existent bipedal creature with small limbs, which brings us back to our creatures that uh, were at uh, Breeden on the Hill, 7th, 8th century depictions. So, you know, we, we can't positively say, because we can't go to the chat and say, you know, did you really see these or did you make them up? But it is so interesting, you know, these little things just all tie together. But it seems quite reasonable to believe from the Babylonian seal, from Beowulf, from the epic poems and what he did, depictions there that such creatures which we don't see today but uh, very much dinosaur type and the uh, depictions, similar depictions on the tomb in uh, Carlisle, that they did uh, exist. And he slew other creatures, huge uh, flying uh, creatures and sea dragons. Uh, it was turned into a film, hence uh, the depiction of him. Now, there is uh, an ancient chronicle, the Geoffrey Monmouth's Chronicle, which again today people poo-poo and think it's all made up, but he sketches the history of Britain going way, way back. And he has accounts of um, people being slain. This is in 336 BC, that the Welsh king Morid, he was eaten by a monster. And, you know, outside that chronicle, right up, so you can trace um, right up to about 1867 in this country of accounts of people being terrified of these monsters. And uh, there's uh, a contemporary account of the slaying of this monster uh, at Frittleworth in Sussex. And that's only 1867. So up to quite recent times, I believe that many of these uh, dinosaur-like creatures uh, were in existence. So why did God create dinosaurs? Well, I think they were his lawnmowers. You know we need to cut the grass. In fact, uh, earlier this week, I went for a walk, and there was a lady mowing her lawn. And we were only in February. Grass grows, doesn't it? Well, I believe that in the pre-flood world, before the great changes of the flood, that the conditions were quite different to what they are now. There were no seasons, there was no rain. It was seen that uh, there was an equitable climate throughout the world. And just as humans were living up to nearly a thousand years, Methuselah, so plants and animals uh, were living longer and would grow bigger. And with the wonderful creation there must have been abundant trees and that, grasses, shrubs and that. And I believe God created these creatures to keep the vegetation down, to mow the grass, as it were. And I believe they were taken onto the ark. And you say, well, how could he get a dinosaur, you know, the size of this or twice the height, onto the ark? But just bear in mind that God brought the animals to Noah. Why did God bring the, Noah, bring the animals to Noah? Well, the purpose was that after the flood, they would repopulate the earth. And so God would bring not old creatures that were past their breeding season, as it were, but would bring young animals. Now, even the biggest dinosaur that wouldn't fit in this room started off from an egg, which is no bigger than a football, ruggable. Um, and so young dinosaurs, uh, you know, they, they grow from an egg the size of a rug ball up to those who create. It takes years and years. Um, and so there will be absolutely no problem for Noah to take on dinosaurs. God will take them to him. They will go on the ark and come off the ark. But in the changed conditions, they would eventually demise. Because I believe, as I say, there were great changes and their need was gone. There wasn't that such abundant growth after the flood. And just as man led shorter lives, so animals. Now, um, 
Dinosaurs are cold-blooded creatures, and one of the characteristics of cold-blooded creatures, as opposed to humans who are warm-blooded, is that they carry on growing until they die. Fortunately, as parents, because you have warm-blooded children, they grow and grow and grow, and then they stop, fortunately. They don't carry on growing, carry on growing until the time they're dead. But cold-blooded creatures do, so your crocodiles and that will just get bigger and bigger and bigger as the older they get. So this begins to explain why the dinosaurs were so big. They were creatures which, if they lived a shorter life, would be much smaller. But because living in the pre-flood conditions and fossilised in the flood, then they could be you know, up to a thousand years old and would grow to immense sizes. So that's an important point. So if man and animals lived much longer before the flood, then we would expect giant remains, not just of dinosaurs. We get fossilised frogs, which are much, much bigger um, than frogs of today, just simply because they lived much longer and therefore grew bigger. Um, this is... Um, uh, well, the top one was uh, giant ammonites, much, much bigger uh, than... Uh, we, we find today, and these are, are giant oysters. Again, much, much bigger scale. You know, there's a pick, um, and you see how big they are, the length of a shaft of a, of the spike of a pick. So much bigger than we would normally expect. But again, if creatures were living longer, they would, from little tiny ones, get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Also, there were more problems after the flood. I believe that the atmosphere changed, the lighter atmosphere, which would then make it harder for the blood to get to the brain because the pressure, atmospheric pressure plays a big role in blood circulation in these big creatures. There would be less food for them, so um, it was harder for them to live. There was less oxygen when one analyses the amount of oxygen that there is in some of these... Um, Name's gone from me. Um, sorry? Amber. The amber, yes. Uh, they find that the oxygen level is higher than it is today. So probably there's less oxygen. So everything was against uh, these creatures. And so they would slowly die out. But it was only slowly, and hence the historic depictions uh, and these stories. And in Job's time, soon after the flood, all these creatures would be there. They hadn't died out. And have they totally disappeared? Well... Probably not, because the large creatures of today, the um, lizards and the um, Komodo dragons and that, if they could live much longer than they do, then they would get to sizes like that. So the Komodo dragon um, has a, a lifespan of about um, 30 years, and in that 30 years it gets up to about 6 metres. Uh, sorry, I'm exaggerating. 3 metres. Uh, so if it lived twice as long, um, it, it would uh, get up to the size of that creature that they found in Australia. So that could just be a s remains of uh, a Komodo dragon that had lived longer than they do today and therefore was on a much bigger scale. But vicious creatures. So, yeah, dragons probably were part of these dinosaurs, some of these creatures were fire-breathing from what we have in Job, and hence the depiction around the world, and this will come into the second part as well. So just uh, Jurassic Park, the, the idea of this film was uh, the recreation from DNA uh, of the prehistoric creatures, and uh, I mean, I'm no scientist, but this is what I read, that the the chances of being able to recreate life from DNA has been likened to a book of 400 pages uh, which has gone through the shredder and your task is to piece all those bits back to recreate the 400 pages. And before you put your hand up and say, yes, I'll do it, you really ought to know that it's written in a language which you don't understand, an entirely foreign language. The other imposition is you're going to have one hand tied behind your back, and that's not Rebecca. It does look like her, but it's not Rebecca. Um, one hand tied behind your back, 
And the other thing you really should know before you undertake this task is you're going to be put into a room which is in total darkness. So your task is to put together these shredded bits of the 400-page book in a language you don't understand with one hand behind your back and you can't see it. The chances of doing it are zilch. But you see, fiction makes money, doesn't it? Um, Jurassic Park was the biggest grossing film of its time, more than a billion, uh, until Titanic came along. Uh, last year, Jurassic Park 5, the uh, four, sorry, in the series, that's already gross, 1.6 billion, and they've got another one. It's money spinning. It's not truth, but it does appeal to youngsters, appeals to grown-ups as well. Well, I've said my piece, and I'm going to stop there, because that's the last slide.